Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, very happy to, to have you join us today to discuss a very exciting and interesting topic, solar, PV, diesel, energy storage solutions uh, integration, specifically for CNI businesses and with a strong focus on, on Nigeria, even though a lot of what you will hear today uh, can also be applied to many other locations. Um, but definitely a, a very popular topic today. We're very happy to, to, to be welcoming so many of you. Um, and also very happy to, to welcome Gabriel and Titus, who will tell you everything um, about the, the latest solutions and the latest technology that is currently available, uh, specifically for, for CNI businesses that are looking into hybrid solutions. Before I give the word to Gabriel, I would like to quickly tell you a few words uh, about Avsia. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Avsia, we are the Africa Solar Industry Association. Um, most of the time you see us as an information platform, uh, sharing all possible news about solar energy in Africa. But actually we, we also offer a whole range of additional services to our members um, based on market intelligence with some of the largest databases available in, in the industry. A lot of B2B matchmaking uh, efforts as well. Uh, our members are constantly looking for new partners, new opportunities, and, and this is one of our responsibilities to, to help them uh, to, to generate leads and connect with the right partners. Um, we have a job portal, very, very popular. We organize webinars like today. Um, and we also have a very extensive projects database with currently more than 7,500 projects already identified in Africa. Um, so all great resources for uh, members who are looking to further develop their business in Africa. All this is only possible thanks to our amazing team. Um, we have Ines, Aline, Jose, and Vestine. Um, big thank you to them because they're doing amazing work and I hope you will be able to get in touch with them very, very soon. Um, here, a quick snapshot uh, of our existing members. We have different member categories, founding member, partner members, strategic members, and a whole lot of corporate members as well. Um, and I hope we will be uh, we will be having the pleasure of hosting you as well uh, as one of our members uh, in the near future. And before I give the word to Gabriel, I also want to give you a quick uh, quick overview of all the great activities and content that we have scheduled for the coming months. Um, you see on the left side all the things that we've been doing in the previous months, a lot of webinars, uh, some prime content with some very interesting conferences. Um, today we are discussing PV diesel hybrids in Nigeria. Uh, next month we will have a very cool conference um, about all the solar opportunities in DRC. In July we have a webinar uh, scheduled to discuss solar for irrigation and that webinar will be in French and in Arabic uh, with English translation. Um, and then down the road, a little later in September, our uh, flagship event, let's call it like this, the Avzia Solar Awards, uh, recognizing excellence in, in the solar industry. And I hope that many of you will be submitting an application and hopefully will win an award. So this is it about, uh, about Avzia, um, but I don't want to keep you for too long before delving into today's topic. Um, we want to discuss hybrid solutions uh, specifically for the CNI sector um, and as our first speaker today I'm very happy to welcome Gabriel Richard who is the sales manager for Sub-Saharan Africa at Elum Energy. Um, Gabriel brings a lot of experience in the field, he's been working uh, almost all over the world, Europe, Hong Kong, Australia over the past five years and now he's based in South Africa. Um, he worked predominantly in, uh, in the IPP and EPC business uh, with companies such as SAFT, NEO and GRDF um, and now focuses really on the, um, on the hybrid solutions with, uh, with LM Energy um, and um, in terms of education it does not have one master's but two master's, uh, one focused on uh, renewable energy engineering and project finance. So a really 
complete background um, for Gabriel, and I'm very, very pleased, Gabriel, to to be welcoming you now and switching over to you so that you can tell us a little bit about what Elum Energy is about and what your technology makes possible for hybrid CNI solutions. Thank you so much, uh, John, for this uh, great introduction. Thank you as well for the overview you gave us. Um, and thank you to everyone that's attending, maybe people from Nigeria, but as well from all across uh, Africa and across the world. Um, we will try to, uh, to see today how to tackle the challenges of hybrid uh, integrations. I will now share my screen. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and here we go. So I'm Gabriel, um, engineer uh, in renewable energies and uh, in project finance. Um, I work for Elam Energy uh, and I'm a sales manager uh, for Western Africa. Um, so we'll have, just for the summary, we'll have a quick look at uh, a company overview. Uh, then we'll be able to dig deeper into the, the focus of today's solar hybrid systems integration uh, before having a look at the solutions um, Elam can actually offer, and then we'll have a bit uh, of fun with uh, some use cases. So, a quick uh, company overview. Elam Energy is a French company. Maybe you can hear it <laughs> by my accent. Uh, our headquarters are in Paris, and we have uh, currently offices in Casablanca, Cape Town, and Mumbai. Uh, this year, we will be opening up in Singapore and Sao Paulo. So, as you can see, a very global company with sites uh, equipped uh, of our technology across 40 different countries. But what do we do exactly? In a few words, we provide control and monitoring solutions for solar hybrid systems. So, what do we include in solar hybrid? Pretty much any solar system coupled with another power generation source. May it be hydro, may it be wind. Uh, but to be fair, the most popular configuration being solar plus genset or solar plus battery or solar plus genset plus battery. So Elam provides both the hardware and the software to tackle hybrid system integration challenges. We provide solutions to various players, may it be large IPPs, smaller ones, international APCs such as Teto, Toto or Green Yellow, but also local APCs. Uh, for example, in Nigeria, Sunshine, or, or Starsight. So, um, we do operate in, in different fields, uh, maybe utility scale, microgrids, or, or rooftop solar. Um, even if today we will be focusing only on microgrid uh, and some microgrid rooftop solar. One of our most important value is our compatibility. We like to say we are hardware agnostic, that we are able to integrate with all the players of the market, um, maybe the brands of inverters, PCS, solar panels. So we bring compatibility, standardization, and easy commissioning to solar APCs. Here uh, you can see a few brands, uh, but this is not a comprehensive list. In other words, our solutions are EPC friendly. Why? Because we allow EPCs to save time and money. When? First of all, during design phase, because we are compatible with our brands, obviously that makes things easier. During commissioning, because our dedicated eConf software will support you step by step on the configuration of your integrated system. And then during all the lifetime of the asset, thanks to remote control and monitoring features, making, life, making the life uh, of ONM teams easier. So let's dig deeper into our, our core topic. And let's go back to, to basics. What's a microgrid? A microgrid is an intelligent energy distribution system network that relies on local means of producing energy. So it normally operates connected and synchronous to the microgrid. 
However, it can disconnect to island mode and therefore function autonomously. Now, a solar system, a solar hybrid system I have defined before. And during this presentation, I will first uh, go through uh, the on-grid, grid tight configuration uh, before having uh, a deeper look into the off-grid configuration. So first of all, uh, grid tight and specifically poor grid. What do I need by poor grid? Uh, I guess you already know that uh, poor power grids are extremely sensitive to load imbalance. Uh, what does it cause? Frequency fluctuations. And obviously, in such conditions, they are unable to maintain st stability and therefore they collapse. They collapse, blackout. And what do we need? A backup system. So, on the first, um, on the first uh, scheme, uh, I will be showing uh, the PV GESO integration. Uh, here you can see you have uh, a CNI installation, some gensets connected to a power grid uh, with an ELAM controller here uh, sending data to the ePower monitor. From the ePower monitor, you can control and monitor uh, all of your installation thanks to, to this integration. So what happens is that most people don't actually know that in case of load shedding event, uh, what happens is that you'll be losing all of the solar production. Why? Uh, because they are not aware that a hybrid system needs a control strategy uh, between the various power generation sources. In other words, you need to integrate your hybrid installation. That is one of the main value that Elon controllers bring and its EMS is bringing such type of, um, of features. Um, now let's have a look uh, at the BSS. Uh, in this configuration, this is pretty much the same. Only difference is you have uh, some battery storage here. So let's have a look at uh, the features. As I was telling you, uh, in a context where you don't have any battery, okay, we are just speaking of uh, solar PV plus GSO integration, uh, you will lose your solar production uh, during a load shedding event. This is why it's important to integrate, and this is how the controllers can help you. They can help you, first of all, by doing maximum solar penetration, uh, meaning that you, you can be sure that at any time, even during uh, a load shedding event, the inverters will still kick in and will still be able to maximize your solar PV penetration. On the other side, on the side of the genset, uh, the controller will also make sure that um, each genset, each genset um, will uh, be at its minimum genset loading, usually around 30%, but that can uh, depend on uh, the manufacturer. Uh, there's also the grid feed-in management. So in the case of Nigeria, uh, we are looking at zero export as the grid operators do not allow, do not allow to reverse power uh, on the grid. Now, what, what could we do if we had a battery? First of all, we would have, um, we would have a more reliable uh, power and we would also have uh, a higher uh, solar penetration. The features, the features that can be offered by a, an ELAM controller will be load shifting, uh, which is pretty much a short-term reduction in electricity consumption uh, usually followed by an increase in production. You can do load control, meaning that the controller will make sure that non-essential controllable loads, for example, uh, an EV charging station, for example, uh, HVAC in a supermarket, uh, to make sure that these non-essential controllable loads are supplied by solar when, when PV production is higher than essential equipment's demand. Then you also have the possibility of peak shaving, uh, of course. Uh, once again, you need a controller, you need an EMS to do that. Uh, peak shaving is pretty much uh, discharging your battery when load is high uh, to make sure that you not exceed the threshold of, that can be fixed uh, depending on the pricing and the grid specificities. 
who are the end users and how can an EPC uh, promote its solution? Uh, so I can promote them um, through uh, four CNI facilities. Uh, for example, uh, you can think of a bottling fat factory that will be very happy to integrate uh, solar with its uh, chainset backups. Uh, thinking about um, fuel stations, uh, as you may know, in Nigeria, Total is solarizing uh, a lot of its fuel stations. Um, furthermore, you can apply this to bank facilities. Uh, as you know as well, uh, we have dozens, we can see dozens, dozens of tenders at the moment uh, for solar rooftops uh, of bank facilities. Now let's have a look at the same kind of, con of configuration, but off-grid. Off-grid, uh, it's pretty easy to understand. You are not connected to the grid and uh, it works by generating electricity from PV or genset uh, with or without a battery. So this being clear, uh, if you go on the left side, once again, uh, we have a configuration without a battery. Uh, the idea of having an EMS here is to reduce the OPEX. How? By reducing uh, the, the, the fuel usage um, and also uh, reducing the site CO2 footprint. Now, uh, on the right side, uh, we have a configuration with a battery off-grid as well. Uh, and here we can see uh, that it will be the BSS that will help compensate micro, -grid, micro cuts uh, due to the change of energy source grid forming. Now, let's have a look at the features. First of all, uh, we have the same features, the minimum genset loading and the maximum solar penetration. Uh, these ones are exactly the same as the one uh, previously mentioned. Now, if we have a DSS, we can actually, actually do spinning reserve optimization. Uh, it's a long word just to say that spinning reserve level is set to ensure stability and reliability while minimizing fuel consumption. In other words, the idea is to always keep a reserve of instantaneous power. The controllers will once again help you uh, optimize this. And then if the batteries are grid forming, then we can directly switch to diesel off mode. Uh, and in this case, it will be the ESS that will be grid forming. For the customers here, uh, we can look at uh, rural electrifications. Uh, there's a lot of programs in, in Nigeria for to electrify uh, remote villages, and this can be done thanks to solar, genset, and BSS. Uh, we can look at mining as well. Uh, the mining industry it's often in very remote sites, uh, and so adding BSS can definitely uh, help increase the penetration of PV. And then on a last, a uh, last part. Uh, all, the, um, all the industries that are in remote areas, maybe agriculture, fishery, forestry, um, usually small and medium sized off grid systems uh, are really looking forward to being electrified uh, thanks to PV and BESS. Now, which solutions can actually tackle these challenges? Pretty much uh, on the left side, uh, we have all the ones, the two ones that will take care of uh, genset integration, uh, one for single genset, uh, the HFS for multiple genset. In the middle, the microgrid uh, controller that will help manage uh, your BESS. Uh, and then on the right side, uh, this uh, PPC controller is more reserved for larger scale. Uh, how do we connect? We connect to both the PV inverter, the, the genset, the load, and the grid. Uh, all the decisions are made by the HFS and sends orders to the PV inverters. Same configuration for the ePower control MC controller. Uh, the difference will be that we will have uh, to manage the battery PCS as well. Now, looking at uh, the configuration, as I told you, our main value is to be EPC friendly. So we try to have an e-conf that will accompany you step by step uh, and that will help you commission your system faster than ever. A few screenshots here uh, to see the e-configuration software. 
These are the different platforms you can monitor your system from, thanks to the e-power monitoring platform. Um, and then if you have different sites, you can definitely uh, monitor them uh, via this platform. Here you will have a view of the different loads and uh, the total PV energy production, uh, how is the grid and how is uh, the battery interacting. You can also, also edit some alarms if you have some uh, specific uh, requests. Now let's have a look at the use cases. Uh, the first one is in Gambia. Uh, and here the challenge is that we had to integrate more, we had actually to integrate six uh, different gensets with 500 uh, kilowatts of PV. So uh, we did that thanks to the HFS controller. And as well, we provided the ePower monitoring interface uh, in order to monitor this system uh, both in the center and as well in the United Nations office, offices in Gambia. Uh, here we had a supermarket in South Africa uh, where we had a massive genset. However, uh, the, we used only the, the small e-power control SD, which, is, which you can actually uh, hold in your hand uh, to ensure optimal PV production while making sure that the genset works at the minimum genset loading. And then a bigger project, uh, this one was in Camoas with a massive uh, storage of Tesla. Uh, this project was very specific as um, the project asked us to actually switch from a local grid to a microgrid to off-grid um, and be able to, to make smoothly and autonomously these transitions. So pretty much Tesla uh, was not able to provide these controlling features. So this is why uh, we managed the whole EMS of this project. This is uh, pretty much it for me. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for attending. And uh, we will definitely be uh, looking forward to answering all of your questions. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Uh, very interesting. And also, I, I know from experience that uh, people are always very interested in, in learning about concrete projects, which you have described um, at the end of your presentation. I'm sure there will be many questions about this later on. Um, yeah. This is actually a great opportunity for me to, to remind everybody, um, please submit your questions as they as they come up. You, you have this. Um, uh, you have this option in the in the dashboard from GoToWebinar. Um, several several of you have already submitted their questions. We will address all of them um, after Titus' presentation, just so that we make sure we we address as many of them as possible. Um, talking about Titus, um, I would like to make a quick introduction before I pass on the word to him. Um, I would like to share my screen. There we go. So Titus, many of you know him already, I am sure. Uh, he's the technical service manager uh, for Jinko Solar based out of Kenya. Um, brings amazing solar experience, more than 10 years now, focusing on, on East Africa, but also traveling in many other parts. Um, and he's worked with some of the um, big names uh, in the region, African Solar Designs, Solar Gen Technology, Kenya Power. Um, and over the last two years, he's been working with, uh, with Jinko Solar as technical service manager, uh, mostly focusing on, on technical support and business development across Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and Titus' original educational background is a, is a master's in energy and engineering from the Kenyatta University in Kenya. Um, so Titus, I'm, I'm very happy to, to welcome you as well today. Um, many listeners are pro probably familiar with Jinko as one of the uh, big global names for, for solar modules, but I think you, you will also tell us a little bit about uh, storage today. Uh, thank you so much, John, uh, for the introduction. I think you've said it correctly. And uh, again, uh, thank you also to uh, everyone for joining in today. Uh, we're hoping that uh, we are hoping that today we are going to uh, ideally have some very insightful session. So um, one is that 
and as mentioned to um, everyone by John, that I work for Jinko Solar uh, in charge of technical for the Sub Saharan African region. So um, I will now briefly uh, make some brief introduction about uh, uh, Jinko Solar. I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. It's working well, yes, no problem. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. So um, ideally, uh, Jinko, I'm not going to say so much about Jinko because uh, we are a non module manufacturer and um, we have already we already have presence in the market. Uh, ideally, uh, in all countries in Africa and also in the world, and in Nigeria specifically, we also have presence. We have a sales office in uh, Nigeria, and uh, also we supplied a number of projects in Nigeria. So ideally, I really don't have to um, stress so much on the, stress so much on that. And um, again, is that um, our core business is uh, solar PV modules. That is what we ideally doing as our core business in terms of uh, manufacturing of uh, solar PV modules. We have manufacturing facilities in the, in the, in three different countries. That is, uh, and uh, also a total of eleven manufacturing facilities. And um, ideally, uh, for our solar modules portfolio, what we are having is that uh, we are having a range that is uh, for different applications. And uh, this range, ideally, we are talking about uh, for residential, uh, for commercial, and also for utility. And um, the main uh, applications is that, uh, of course, the power range is uh, between 390 watt peak currently and uh, 550 watt peak. So it's good also to note that that um, there have been uh, so much developments in the industry that we are on, on now focusing on the on the high power modules and also for the efficiency of the solar PV modules. As you're aware, is that uh, the industry or other is now moving into high efficiency solar PV modules. So ideally, what we have currently is efficiencies of more than 20% and up to 1%. So that is ideally some very huge developments. So these are ideally from our product range. You can always get uh, more information from our websites and also from us if you need any specific uh, solar PV modules. Then uh, just to also illustrate is that as I said, our core business is solar PV modules, but also we also do um, energy storage solutions. And um, yeah, as uh, for energy storage, we more of a uh, uh, rather system integrator in that we we providing solutions for our residential uh, energy storage. We also providing solutions for C and I, which is our main focus today, and uh, also utility. So for the residential, ideally, it's uh, less than fifty kilowatt hour systems, the small units, either single phase or three phase. Then um, ideally for the C and I, which is our main topic for today, is uh, ideally up to one megawatt hour or even more than that, depending on the requirement. On the requirement and uh, the solution that we offer can either be DC coupled or AC coupled. So we're also going to talk about uh, the two. And uh, of course, for utility, that is uh, ideally in some instances in some other countries uh, where we need to ideally support the utility. Of course, we're also providing some kind of uh, solutions as well. Then to also note is that we can look uh, from the pictures clearly you can see that um, our solutions we come uh, come in different uh, packages in that we of course we've already integrated all the different components that we're going to talk about that and um, this we have them in uh, either our cabinets or also we have them in our containers containers that means from our 10 foot containers 20 and uh, 40 foot containers. So uh, just to, uh, of course, for the uh, PV storage for CNDI solutions, which is ideally our uh, main topic for today, is that uh, the CNDI market is uh, ideally booming for not only for Nigeria, but uh, for the whole of Africa and also the rest of the world. And um, of course, the, the, the main uh, reason for this um, is ideally because of the cost and um, because of the cost. And uh, looking into just uh, some brief overview, I know uh, Gabriel, uh, that is from Elum, also mentioned this, is that um, the differences of energy. And uh, for, for this case, for Nigeria, for, uh, for this case is that, um, of course, the main uh, source that we're using ideally in the market is uh, actually from the grid at the moment. Uh, but we find that in uh, for the past few years, the grid has not been uh, very stable. And uh, we find ourselves um, also adding uh, for standby units so, uh, for diesel, or in some instances, we have diesel as prime, and then we also have grid as backup in some other instances. But for the last few years, we've seen developments in that we also add another source of energy, like solar PV, battery, uh, wind, and um, the rest. 
So, but uh, standing out in terms of technology, what you find out is that uh, PV and battery is ideally becoming very uh, competitive and a lead, uh, lead combination for hybrid solutions. And uh, of course, uh, the, the reason is um, ideally notable because uh, compared to uh, other sources like diesel, it's, uh, of course, it's a clean source of um, energy. And also the main aspect is ideally on the cost in that we're not only looking into uh, the initial costs or rather the capex, but we're now we are looking at the cost of energy from our solar PV and battery-based systems. And the cost is actually tied to the developments in uh, either the solar PV modules and also the uh, energy storage technologies. Like now for the solar PV modules, we are focusing on the high power and also high efficiency of PV modules. And also for the energy storage, we are using, uh, we are seeing uh, storage technologies with uh, very uh, long lifespans and also energy density. Like now the lithium ion phosphate, uh, we're going to look about that today. And uh, for the, of course, for the solar and battery storage technology as well, is that integrating also other energy sources like uh, diesel, uh, like wind, um, like grid, uh, also hydro, all others is that it's it's very easy to integrate because of uh, the robustness of the system. So um, now is that, uh, as I said, this is uh, of course some bit of developments if, in, when it comes to uh, the module side and also the, uh, uh, the battery side. And uh, for the battery side, for the longest time is that, um, of course, for the CNI sector is that uh, for the battery side, what we're looking into is uh, uh, ideally at least six main components. That is one, the safety of this, uh, the safety of the system in case of any failures. Uh, let's say for the case of fires or ETC, you know, that can lead to huge uh, uh, massive, massive losses that is in case of failure of the system. So in terms of safety, we're also looking at the cost and I mentioned about the cost. When you're looking at the cost, it's more of the cost of energy and also the cost of the solution and also the lifespan. And in this case, when you talk about the lifespan, it's ideally the number of uh, cycle life or rather the calendar life of the solution. Then also the specific power and also the energy density. The other thing is ideally also on the performance that we uh, ideally need to, of course, focus on. That is the performance of the system. And uh, you'll agree with me that uh, for most part of Nigeria, like the northern part of Nigeria, uh, uh, the temperatures are quite high. So ideally looking into the performance at high temperatures is very important as well, because it has an impact on the lifespan that we, as we are going to look also about that. So for, for lithium ion is that uh, there are different cell chemistries and uh, different cell chemistries based on the performance and also based on the cost specific energy and all the parameters that are listed will now determine on which lithium ion chemistry will use, be used for certain applications. Like now for the power trains and EV, where we are focusing on the, mainly the specific energy because of the variability of space. And um, of course, so that means that we are having now uh, the nickel cobalt aluminum and also uh, nickel uh, manganese uh, cobalt for this kind of applications. But when it comes to uh, the PV plus storage, the main factor that we are considering is the cost because we need the lowest cost of energy, also the lifespan to be able to achieve the lowest cost of en uh, energy and storage as well, and also the safety of the system. So if you see now in terms of uh, all these parameters, you find that um, lithium and phosphate solutions the ideally ticks almost all the parameters. Yes, we cannot achieve that is uh, like for the case of specific energy, uh, lithium uh, and uh, lithium and phosphate is not having the best specific energy. But of course, it's uh, more of a trade-off, and we focus on the, the three main aspects. Maybe in future, maybe in future now we'll have a technology where we'll have the best specific energy, the best specific power, and also uh, the three other components that is the cost safety and also the lifespan. But at the moment, it's more of the best uh, competitive and also reliable, uh, uh, reliable uh, lithium ion uh, uh, cell chemistry. So um, now is that I said is that. Uh, we, well, of course, uh, our solutions are based on the lithium ion phosphate. And the reason for that is that, and as I said also, that we also acting as a system integrator that we are having all the components in one unit, either a uh, either cabinet or um, either cabinet or, um, or a container in that we have being uh, uh, the battery unit. We also have being, uh, uh, the power conversion system. We also have being uh, the SCADA and also the other elements like the ancillary systems. 
the reason why this ideally the best uh, the best uh, the best solution is that um, of course from uh, the cell chemistry we discuss about that and that uh, of course the energy density is good and also the liability in terms of theft and also the cost and also looking also into uh, the efficiency compared to other energy storage technologies it's among the best efficiency because we are getting efficiencies of more than 95 percent then um, the other thing is, uh, of course, looking into the design of the system is that um, ideally you can have, uh, you can build up the units that is uh, from a small uh, unit to other bigger units into up to middle art scale. And um, what is also very important is uh, thermal management. Uh, ideally, like I said, is that uh, the operation of batteries is very important to consider uh, the, the, that is uh, that is the working environment or rather uh, the operating environment, especially in the temperatures. You can see in this case, as you can see from uh, from this graph, is that this how a battery cell uh, operates at different temperatures. Ideally, uh, it's ideal for the battery temp uh, for the battery cell to operate at uh, room temperature that is 25 degrees Celsius to be able to achieve uh, that is uh, uh, the best uh, number of cycles. You can see in this case we can even get up to more than 5,000 cycles. But if it works at uh, certain, uh, let's say, high temperatures like for five degrees Celsius or uh, five degrees Celsius, you can see the effects is that you can actually even achieve two thousand cycles, and that has a direct impact on the direct impact on the on the, ideally the uh, the lifespan of the battery uh, technology. So um, for now, is that uh, as I said, from uh, the integration perspective, is that uh, we are having these units in one, uh, of course, either one cabinet or one container. And what is contained in uh, this cabinet or the container is ideally uh, we have the batteries, uh, okay, the lithium ion phosphate batteries. Then of course uh, the control unit that is now the best controller, uh, the best controller ideally to uh, manage data position and also to control the system. And the other essential component is ideally the power conversion system. Uh, the power conversion system to manage now the conversion from uh, AC to DC and also DC to uh, AC. And uh, of course, to uh, of course to control the charging of the batteries is that um, ideally to achieve uh, better cell balancing is uh, the DC DC converter, where we also have it in the system. And I uh, remember that lithium ion phosphate batteries is that work best under constant uh, constant current also as the voltage. So we achieve this using uh, the DC DC converters. Then um, you'll agree with me also that um, in some instances for your applications is that you might need to, um, of course, to switch from one power source to another at the shortest time, like in the order of milliseconds. So to achieve this is that uh, we have the static transfer switch. So, and, um, yeah, so this is how uh, the system uh, looks like in terms of uh, the configuration. We can see the system topologies is that um, ideally you have um, you, you have the battery unit, you have the battery unit, of course, you have the DC-DC converter to control the charging of uh, to control the charging of uh, the batteries, then uh, uh, the PCS, uh, the PCS as well, and also the controller to control the whole system. And also you can see the different energy sources, that is uh, from the solar PV, uh, DG and um, uh, grid, and also many other, it depends on the, which kind of hybrid combination you'd like to ideally work on. So um, again, is that uh, one of the most essential part of, uh, of course, um, hybrid solution is um, rather for the hybrid solution is the EMS. And uh, I think Gabriel uh, from the previous presentation talk about that. And um, ideally what we do is that uh, the EMS is more of the brain of the whole system where we get to control. That is all the other elements, not only control, but also to monitor all the other elements that is from the PCS, uh, the BMS, uh, uh, the B, uh, B, uh, that is the thermal management system, or rather the HVAC, and also uh, the other modules like the monetary modules. And this case is that um, as part also of this is that we have the BMS, and uh, for the BMS, what we have is that um, we want to, uh, of course, be the battery management system. Uh, the battery management system is a very important unit for uh, lithium ion phosphate solutions. In that um, we need to, of course, monitor uh, monitor the batteries up to the cell level. And uh, monitoring this is that uh, we get to monitor that is uh, the current, we get to monitor the voltage and also the temperatures. And it's not only monitoring, but also it has the control function. So the control function is the one that 
helps uh, the system achieve now uh, protection against overcharging, over discharging, uh, that is high temperatures and also ground fault, and also to be able to, of course, uh, balance the um, uh, balance the uh, that is achieve cell balance in terms of uh, system voltage, and uh, for the BMS as well, uh, for the BMS as well, that, uh, it's also good to maintain uh, that is a uh, recommended uh, uh, depth of distance. We understand that uh, for the lithium ion phosphate, we can ideally achieve 100% uh, depth of discharge. But it, um, is this recommended? What we actually recommend, and also what our manufacturers recommend, is that we recommend uh, ideally between 8 to 90%. Yet we can achieve uh, 100%, but 8% uh, to 90% is ideally recommended so as to uh, stop uh, stressing the cells. There's also uh, the charging rate of uh, the batteries and also the discharge rate. It, depending on the cell technology, is that um, rather the type of cell is that uh, this is a uh, charge rate either 0.5C, uh, 1C, 2C, or it depends. And um, of course, as I've said, for the thermal management system, the reason why thermal management is very important is that um, at very low temperatures, let's say negative temperatures, is that uh, this can uh, lead to a daily stress charging because um, because this high resistance develop inside the solar cells, and also at very high temperatures that can easily lead to uh, a daily thermal uh, runaway. So for the monitoring function is that, uh, of course, monitoring is one way to be able to, um, of course, reduce on your own damn cost by um, ideally be able to interact with the system remotely or uh, maybe on site to be able to know on uh, how the system performing. So this is just a screenshot from one, uh, uh, from one of uh, the projects that we've done. And uh, you can see how the system is performing, is that you can ideally have, have view on what company is working at this moment and now what is the generation looks like and of course in case of any faults or any alarms you can also be able to uh, get to know exactly and of course for the monitoring function of course it is now coupled with the bms is that you can be able to know on the of course if there's any fault in any cell or any module or battery module you can be able to also identify uh, to be able to reduce on the, um, uh, the time of uh, of course the maintenance so uh, for the application scenarios is that, uh, of course, uh, the different application scenarios depending on the requirements and uh, ideally for this uh, containerized units or the units in cabinets can have uh, different applications like now for C and I, because we are looking to either demand response, we're looking to be shifting, we're looking to back up out, as I think this was mentioned uh, in the previous uh, presentation from um, Hello. So um, for projects is that uh, ideally these are some of the key projects that uh, we've uh, done for the last few years. So um, we've done most projects in China, North America, and also we now are supplying a project in uh, Nigeria. That is a one megawatt hour project in Nigeria that is still under um, uh, delivery. And also, also in other regions and also other projects in uh, East and also Central Africa. So uh, that is the end of uh, my presentation. Just in case of um, any uh, any inquiries, you can always uh, get in touch with us at any uh, given time. This is my email address, and also I've also attached the email, uh, what indicated the email for ourselves, uh, manager for West Africa. Thank you so much, uh, George. Uh, John, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Titus. <laughs> Thank you very much, and. Uh, very interesting presentation, if only judging based on the number of questions that we have been receiving uh, while both of you, uh, Gabriel and Titus, were, were presenting. Thank you so much for sharing all of this. And uh, without waiting any further, um, I would actually like to jump into these questions because really there, there are many. I already suspect we will not have time to address them all. This being said, no problem. Um, if you have a question and if we don't have time to, to address that question during the upcoming Q&A session, we will follow up uh, these questions. If you submit them through the question uh, module, uh, will be recorded and will be addressed later on by our speakers or their colleagues later on. So no, no problem there. Um, first question, first question to Gabriel. Uh, Lalit is wondering if there is like a minimum or a maximum project size um, that is recommended or limiting to, to be using your controllers. Okay, thank you Lalit for, for this question. Uh, so, to be fair, there isn't any limitation in terms of size. 
uh, regarding the maximum, we are always happy to make big projects uh, and we've already worked on utility scale. Um, so that's not an issue. Uh, and we can definitely, and our solutions are definitely applicable on small scales. However, um, the main question uh, is regarding uh, the economic sense of implementing such a controlled strategy. From my experience and from the cases we've been uh, seeing, I would say that uh, implementing uh, a smart EMS uh, and a relevant control and monitoring strategy uh, starts making sense uh, from 50 kilowatts, maybe with or without storage. And actually, I, I jumped on the opportunity here. Titus, I will come back to you in a second, but a uh, second question for Gabriel. Sunday is wondering, how are the controllers priced? What is the pricing? How does it work? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sunday, for this question. So uh, let's say that uh, we, have, we, we have two parts. Uh, the, really the standard projects uh, and uh, the more tailored, uh, customized, um specifications for a standard uh project and this is what we push uh, the most with standard products um we are really flexible on the price it can go really uh from uh really from let's say uh, 1 million uh, naira uh, which is around 2000 euros uh to uh, maybe two or three or four times the price depending obviously on uh, the number of uh, power generation sources uh, that that will be involved, depending on the size of the project and depending on the complexity of the features that are required. Thank you very much. Um, Titus, um, Benjamin would like to know a little bit more about um, recycling considerations of batteries uh, and especially yours and i would actually like to to extend that question to what is the expected life of storage uh, nowadays because we hear many member uh, many numbers there's a lot of innovation people throwing cycle numbers all over the place um, what is your current view on this plus of course recycling yeah uh, okay i prefer to start with the second question in that um Maybe I'll just uh, try to mention this way. I will, uh, on the last point, I'll just try to say that uh, there are different uh, aspects to look into. One is that uh, I will give a case, let's say for the automotive sector, if we are looking to, um, you are buying maybe a vehicle, are you going to look at the mileage? Or um, of course, are you going to look at the mileage or uh, the year of manufacture? So you can find a, man, a car that was manufactured in 2020, but the mileage is more than uh, 200K uh, kilometers and uh, one in manufactured in 2010 and uh, more than uh, two, uh, more than uh, uh, less than maybe 100K uh, kilometers. So back to the question is that, um, of course, the number of cycles that we are giving is ideally more than 6,000 cycles. So 6,000 cycles, it depends now on the number of cycles per day based on the requirements. So ideally working with uh, one cycle per day, that is one cycle to mean one time cycle and one distance cycle, that ideally means translates to close to more than 15 years uh, calendar life. So it depends on the, ideally the usage of uh, the system. Then on the second question is that, um, of course we are working uh, because we already have a battery disposal policy on uh, of course how to manage that in that in the next uh, 10, 15 years, of course we don't want to dispose of. So we have, uh, we have a battery disposal policy and also we are working with some of uh, institutions uh, ideally from Europe to work on uh, how to be able to dispose the batteries. Thank you very much Titus. Um, I have a question from Thomas which um, yes is, is for both of you I would say. Um, I mean today's the, the, the title of today's presentation is CNI, uh, CNI solutions in, in Nigeria and Thomas is wondering are there any factors, any, any specificities for hybrid systems in Nigeria that based on your experience, you, you are only witnessing in Nigeria and not in other places? And maybe Gabriel can start. Okay, so uh, from my knowledge, um, the grid, the Nigerian grid is pretty specific uh, in that the grid operators don't allow any uh, export 
So that's the first part of the grid feed-in management uh, that we implement on, on our controlled systems that, that we sell in Nigeria. Um, I would say as well that uh, another, specific, another specificity is that because uh, I guess uh, the, the, CNI, the CNI market is used to uh, already having a, a poor grid with a lot, a lot of load shedding uh, and blackouts. Um, most most uh, buildings have gensets. Uh, and so this is why when they move to solar, uh, they really require an integration. That being said, uh, we have seen uh, also some, some events of load shedding that, that uh, could happen during uh, almost during a complete day. Um, and so in that, um, uh, giving that, uh, we can see that it might uh, definitely be uh, worth implementing a battery. And this definitely brings down uh, the cost of integration, giving the, the OPEX uh, that people will be, will be using uh, burning fuel. Thank you. What about you, Titus? What, what uh, special situation or special opportunities do you see in Nigeria? Uh, thank you so much, John. So just to add into what Gabriel said is that um, ideally for Nigeria, based on, the, um, uh, of course, the, uh, the challenge that is the reliability of the grid. So ideally feel that Nigeria deserves uh, reliable solutions reliable solutions in that, uh, of course, to address unreliable solutions, to address unreliable situations that is, is now for the uh, for the sake of the grid. And uh, also for this case is that um, we're also looking into, uh, of course, we have different parts of Nigeria, that is uh, uh, the part close to Lagos, and then we have also the northern part, and also the likes of Abuja. So ideally we need uh, systems that can be able to withstand uh, that is uh, all those, uh, that is all those environmental conditions, like now, uh, for the part closer to the ocean, like uh, Lagos, uh, Lagos, of course, we are looking that is um, uh, solutions with very good uh, that is uh, increased protection and also uh, that can withstand very high humidity as well, and also the sea protection level that is the uh, sea protection levels because that can easily affect on the, the performance of the system. And if you go to the northern part of Nigeria, ideally, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, is that systems that can, of course, be able to adapt to the existing uh, conditions that is now in terms of uh, very high temperatures. So you need solutions that now you have very robust thermal management systems. And uh, yeah, I think also Gabriel mentioned that uh, the BMS is also very important to be able to, of course, to ensure the reliability of the whole uh, the whole system. Thank you very much. And again, I would like to to ask a question to to the both of you, and I will start uh, with Gabriel. Um, if you look at the situation from the other side, who are the people, the businesses who can benefit the most from um, such a hybrid solution? Well, what are like Thomas puts it? Who are the low hanging fruits in Nigeria? Who can benefit uh, the most? I think that um, I mentioned it before. Uh, what I'm seeing, I mean, just in just from the feedbacks of, of the EPCs I'm speaking to in Nigeria, um, there are a lot of tenders uh, coming from the the banks uh, that require integration, uh, solar PV with or without storage. Um, we can see as well um, a lot of uh, factories in remote areas. Uh, and as well, I guess that maybe not low hanging because it's usually government, um, it's usually government programs. Uh, however, maybe on, on a midterm um, business opportunity, the rural electrification for Nigeria is definitely uh, the spot to be. Titus, um, do you see some, some additional opportunities maybe? Yeah, I would say ideally, uh, if it comes to, I would focus more on the commercial, um, that is commercial centers, uh, looking, let's say, uh, for the case of, uh, let's say, banks or malls. Ideally, um, if you don't have power, that means there's no operations. So ideally, you need to have continuity, uh, that is, of operations. 
because uh, I don't know it's exactly in terms of uh, economics on the, how much in Nigeria, but any institution in Nigeria is losing that is per hour or rather per minute loss of power because ideally that is very essential. It also reduces on the hours of operations. The same thing will also happen to industries in terms of uh, production. You always need to maintain uh, constant production. And um, I will also mention something in terms of um, ideally there's some uh, there's some there's some factories. Let's say like plastic uh, like plastic manufacturing factories. You can't actually afford to lose power for even a minute. So ideally, you need uh, such kind of very liable solutions to ensure continuity of um, our production at any given time. So really, like uh, pretty much anyone can really benefit uh, no but really uh it's it's important like the, there is no uh, exclusion um and i hope that many of the listeners today will, will further get in touch with both of you to to look at what can be done for for their sites and how they can benefit um titus i'm coming back to you i have a question from karim um karim is wondering about um your view on um, the future of storage. Uh, what can be expected in terms of innovation um, in the next five, maybe 10 years? Um, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but we would like you to, to tell us a little bit about how you, you feel this, um, this part of the industry is, is evolving. Yeah, in terms of uh, ideally the future, not only uh, for the case of Nigeria, but globally, is that um, we are seeing some very good uh, developments, um, like uh, let's say in terms of cost. I, I think I mentioned this earlier, but um, for the last few years, actually comparing like uh, the last uh, the last decade, let's say in the last 10 years, if you compare the cost of storage in 2010 and uh, the cost of storage in 2020 or 2021, it's actually gone, uh, that is uh, by more than, uh, it's actually reduced by more than 300 percent and even for uh, the PV modules you know, the cost has actually um, uh, reduced so cost is actually going to be of course a uh, main factor in that we are going to achieve the lowest cost that is for and not only for PV modules but also uh, for, but also for uh, energy storage to achieve the lowest uh, lowest cost and uh, the main drivers for this is um, ideally because of uh, technology. So what I think is that in the next five years is that we have uh, lithium ion being the center of all this. Then of course other technologies might also come up maybe when it extends to maybe 10 years that is uh, of course more competitive technologies although they might be a bit costly but it will also take time to of course settle on the part of the cost but cost is uh, ideally going to be a uh, very big development in the, uh, in the next few years. Thank you very much. I'm coming back to you, Gabriel. Uh, I have a series of questions for you. Um, and the first ones are coming from Esgi. Um, Esgi is wondering, which is the device in charge of managing the DG synchronization, diesel generator synchronization? So in the case where you have multiple generators at, on, on one side, what elements actually controls that synchronization? And maybe for, for those listeners who might not be aware of how important synchronization is, maybe you can explain a little bit about why this is crucial. Okay, yeah, definitely. So the, the idea, and that's the particularity of the HFS controller, is to be able to uh, offer different synchronization strategies uh, for the different gensets. Because obviously the genset <clears throat> can be different from different brands uh, being having different power. Uh, and so in this configuration, uh, the master uh, is actually the Elam controller. Uh, and this can be made with or without genset controllers. Um, then if, uh, <clears throat> if you want to go in uh, diesel off mode, uh, you can add you know, an IO module and we will help you in this configuration. So you can definitely have different strategies with, for example, uh, a generator eight is uh, following a, a certain load uh, and some others uh, having a different strategy. Thank you very much. I have a question from Arak Boritze. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. And if I'm not, please, sorry. Um, <laughs> this person is wondering, what is the difference between what LM does and a traditional SCADA system? How should it compare? Okay, so uh, 
Uh, I'm going to. It's a very good question. Thank you very much uh, because um, there's a lot of confuse, confusion uh, around what is a SCADA. So a SCADA will be able just uh, to follow some instructions and be able to give you, uh, you know, be able to read these these information um, thanks to a screen or a, a web platform. Uh, SCADA, so it's a system of control and data acquisition. Uh, we provide this as well. However, uh, the difference is with Elon controllers, it's that you have a real smart strategy that is implemented, what we call an EMS, an energy management system. So a SCADA doesn't necessarily have an EMS. This is what we provide um, more. Thank you very much. Very oh, clear. Fantastic. Sorry, Titus, I had to put you on mute for a second, but I'm unmuting you again because I would like to, to ask you the next question. Again, a question from Esgi, who has many <clears throat> questions today. Very good. Thank you. Um, Esgi is wondering about the after sales service and uh, that you both are providing. So I'll start with Titus and then Gabriel can, can, can maybe also elaborate. Um, apart from the equipment sale, what are the other services that you will provide over the, the lifetime of the equipment? Yeah, so I think that's actually a very good question. And um, as I said, for energy storage, we more of, uh, an, uh, of course, a system integrating that we integrating all the components. And uh, we try as much as possible uh, that before it leaves, um, before it leaves, um, of course, from our centers, is that we try to make very sure that it's um, easy, more of a plug and play system in terms of what is only remaining for the client is um, maybe at site, maybe the civil works and uh, the cable terminations. And uh, that is uh, really, uh, the easiest part. So, for, from that case, is that um, it makes it very easy for us, even for, uh, of course, the remote support. In some instances, let's say for Nigeria, we, in some projects, depending on the scale and also the agreement with the client, we can uh, ideally come to site to support during um, the installation and also the commissioning. And uh, also in some other instances, is that we can also engage to only do uh, remote uh, guidance in the installation and also the commissioning. So that is the support in that we always make sure that we have things done right, because ideally if not done right, that will also affect on the warranties and also um, on the performance of the system. Then, um, of course, now during uh, the operation, we also keep, uh, of course, close monitoring. In that, uh, of course, if there's any faults, we try to be able to uh, uh, to be able to, uh, of course, address any issues that may happen. So currently, what we're working is also in terms of uh, spare parts. We we're also discussing with clients and potential distributors on how to be able to have local stock for the uh, most most parts. And you find that um, we, of course, we have identified units that can easily fail on site so that we can uh, be able to have uh, spare parts so that ideally to respond to um, uh, to respond to any any request from the client uh, that is any request from the client in at least less than uh, 24 hours at any given time thank you titus very clear gabriel on your side what do you propose to to your clients in terms of uh, continued service uh, so what we offer is actually a support, first of all, during the commissioning. Uh, so that's uh, a big added value of EM controllers is being able to support you 24 seven on the commissioning of your project uh, once you, you buy the, the, the device. Okay, so even if uh, we make everything, uh, you know, to make your life easier, even if uh, you have an e-configuration software that guides you step by step, you can still have some trouble during your commissioning, and we support you, um, obviously, free of charge during uh, during this commissioning uh, through our hotline. Or if it was really a project that was particularly complicated, uh, we can uh, obviously, and we usually send the project managers on site. Uh, just just to, to, to make things clear, it's not what we are looking at. We try to make, uh, the products easy and standard to commission so it's really for particular projects uh, and utility scale that uh, we send our engineers on site that being said uh, once the product is uh, commissioned there's all the software part 
uh, that uh, you'll be able um, that, that will allow you to monitor your system, getting all of the data uh, for all the lifetime of your asset. Uh, so usually a solar asset is calculated over 25 years. Uh, I mean, that, that's how the IPPs, uh, that's usually the, the business plan of an IPP. Um, and uh, more important, you will be able to monitor it, but you will also be able to control it, meaning that you are able to change the configuration uh, of, uh, your, of your system. <clears throat> For example, uh, in uh, Peru, uh, where we have uh, some projects that are, that are coupled uh, and integrated with hydropower, uh, depending on uh, if it's wet season or dry season, the strategy of control and integration is different. So that can be very handy for the O&M teams to be able to change the settings remotely without having to go on site. Thank you, Gabriel. And um, I realize we, we have already passed a little bit over time, over the scheduled time. Um, what I suggest is that we take just a few more questions um, because there's really many, many. And again, I would like to remind those of you who would still have questions, please uh, submit them through the, the question box and they will be recorded. And then Gabriel, Titus and their colleagues will, will make sure to follow up with you later on. So they will not be lost. OK. Um, first question to you, Gabriel, a uh, question from Conan Norbert. How do you prioritize between solar, storage, diesel, grids? What, what is the rule you use to decide on which one comes first? Uh, you know, a, magi a magician never gives its tricks. <laughs> no, that, that's the whole, <clears throat> that's exactly the whole uh, optimization work. So uh, depending on, well, that depends on the project, but usually, uh, usually what will be requested by the customer will be to maximize the solar penetration and making sure that we burn the less fuel possible. So what will be prioritized uh, will be uh, the, the, the PV penetration. Uh, however, um, sometimes it's not possible uh, to meet all the demand, all to, to, to respond to all of the load, only thanks to PV and thanks to the energy storage. So in that case, uh, you have the backup, you have the backup of the genset. Uh, how it works? Pretty much, once again, that's a, a strategy game. Uh, you need to have a device that's grid forming. We always keep, uh, unless the, the customer has a specific demand, but uh, we always keep the battery, uh, the BSS, uh, grid forming, meaning that if we need a backup um, uh, from the genset, the first priority will be given to the battery that will get loaded and have an increase of load thanks to the genset. That's pretty much the, the idea. Uh, however, if, if uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the name of the person that asked the question, uh, however, the different priorities and the different code and decision options that are made by the different devices is a question that's very, very interesting. However, it's a bit long to, to go into each case in different scenarios, uh, but that that's uh, that was a, a quick summary. Thank you very much, Titus. Back to you with a very simple and a very complex question at the same time. Mohammed is wondering if you could give us an approximate cost of your storage solution. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think Mohammed, um, I would ideally uh, push the question back to you. In that. Um, which solution do you want? Because ideally, what I said is that um, for the storage, we are not providing a component. We are ideally providing a solution. So for the solution, that means we have uh, the battery, we have uh, the EMS, and uh, sometimes the client might insist that we must use uh, EMS from Elum. So you see, I will have to ask uh, Gabriel or uh, Elum on what is the cost or rather what is the price of, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, EMS. So you see, ideally, if, um, for the solution, 
or I say that uh, we cannot really uh, give a cost, or rather say that the cost is this much, because it depends now on the, the type of solution we want. In some other instances, in some uh, some other projects that we are doing, we find that we are integrating uh, the sea, uh, uh, hydro. We are also integrating uh, diesel uh, grade and also PV, and we also have the, uh, the, the the battery storage. So you see, that is more of a complex scenario. So and also it has it requires some complex uh, control system. So ideally, for now, for that case, in terms of the cost, I prefer that you get to reach to us, then you give us what you want in terms of the solution, then we will get back to you for the cost. I think um, I've simplified that question. I'm sure Mohammed will uh, get in touch very, very soon. And um, I have a last question for, for both of you. Um, some Several people in, uh, in the webinar today were wondering about, do you work with specific technical partners in Nigeria? And if so, can can you tell us who they are? Yes, yeah, so uh, uh, I think I'll take... Okay, no, no, go for it, go for it, teachers. Okay, so uh, just to uh, maybe take up to that is that um, ideally for Nigeria, as I said, is um, of course we are partners and uh, also in terms of uh, it depends. In some other instances, we have distributors that we are working with. We've signed uh, framework agreements and also the distribution agreements, so that we are working, uh, or rather, we are working together to supply our solutions. And um, in some other cases, as well, we are working directly uh, with the EPCs. We are also working directly with the uh, maybe developers, and also even sometimes directly with customers. So it's it's not really focused that we working with only certain partners. But if you want maybe any of our solutions, ideally for the small solutions, let's say the residential or the small commercial, uh, either the PV modules or uh, the PV modules or uh, the energy storage, we can easily refer you to our distributors in uh, based in Nigeria. Currently in Nigeria, we have close to uh, three distributors. Uh, that is in all the, uh, that is in Lagos and also uh, in Lagos and also Abuja, that we can easily refer you that. But for the uh, bigger solutions, like the container solutions, you ideally we need to discuss and be able to allow us to supply it directly from uh, uh, from our factory in China. Thank you, Titus. Gabriel, what about you in Nigeria? How do you operate? Thank you, Titus. Uh, it's a good thing you spoke first because my answer is not as interesting. Uh, mine is just that Elam doesn't have any. Uh, specific partners uh, in Nigeria in, in the sense that we don't have any exclusivity contract. Uh, we are actually open to, to working with everyone, maybe any EPC, local, international, or any or try to integrate with uh, any brand of technical device. So on this side, uh, no, we don't have any preferred technical partners. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, sharing with us about all the all the possibilities and all the benefits of uh, hybrid solutions uh, that people can expect in Nigeria, but also in, in many different places. Um, thank you also to everybody who's been uh, listening and staying with us for slightly over one hour now. Um, the Elam and Jinko team will definitely follow up with you on all the questions that we were not able to address. Um, but again, thank you very much. All the materials, everything in the presentation will be shared. And of course, I look forward to welcoming you very soon again in a next webinar. Thank you, Titus. Thank you, Gabriel. And goodbye to everyone. Beautiful. Thank, thank you, you so John. Much. And thank you, teachers. And thank you, everyone. Take care.